isolating marbles. Thank you for coming. 
conversations with each other here tonight. So there are people here who know a lot about the war, and there are many who know very little about it. So I feel like it is necessary to give just a smattering of content and, I'm, and context, actually. Um, of course, history is full of complexities, and it feels strange to do this, so please forgive me for paring it down. But um, uh, Vietnam by the numbers, I think, is, is um, something I'd just like to, to say a few sentences about for those who know a little less about, about the Vietnam War. In January 1973, the United States <clears throat> and North Korea concluded eight years of warfare, during which an estimated two million Vietnamese died, three million were wounded, and 12 million became refugees. Chemical weapons such as Agent Orange and Napalm defoliated 10% of the country's surface. Agent Orange was the code name for a herbicide and defoliant used by the U.S. military, and it estimated 21,136,000 thousand gallons of it were sprayed across South Vietnam. Many American soldiers and about 4.8 million Vietnamese people were exposed to it, resulting in 400,000 deaths and disabilities, and 500,000 children were born with birth defects. The U.S. spent more than 120 billion on the conflict in Vietnam from 1965 to 73. This massive spending led to widespread inflation, exacerbated by a worldwide oil crisis in 1973, and skyrocketing fuel prices. Psychologically, the effects ran even deeper. The war had pierced the myth of American invincibility and had bitterly divided the nation. Many returning veterans faced negative reactions from both opponents of the war, who viewed them as having killed innocent civilians, and its supporters, who saw them as having lost the war. In 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was unveiled in Washington, D.C. On it were inscribed the names of 57,939 Americans killed or missing during the war. Later additions brought that total to 58,200. So tonight's conversation is going to be moderated by Professor Leon Zalewski. Um, again, she will also be moderating the Berlin Symposium. Um, professor Zalewski has been Assistant Professor of Art here at Randolph College since 2010. She earned her PhD in Art History from City University of New York. She taught there and at the Pratt Institute in New York and at the Massachusetts College of Art in Boston. She has also completed a fellowship at the Center for the History of Art Collecting in America at the Frick Art Reference Library and the Frick Collection in New York. So at this point, I would like to turn the program over to Professor Zaleski. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to now in turn introduce our panelists. Um, so just to, uh, a little bit of a word, this is going to be brief. Um, we're aiming for about 35 minutes, and it is intended to be an informal conversation. So it, it, it will be very informal format. We're just going to be conversing with each other, and I, I welcome anyone to come up afterwards if you have questions uh, to talk to the panelists. But I, I definitely don't want to keep everyone um, here. Um, so first, I want to introduce uh, on my left, and I'm apologizing in advance for, for not pronouncing the names <laughs> correctly. I, I am unable to. <laughs> this is Phong Tran. She's a junior this year at Randolph College. She was born and raised in Vietnam, mainly Saigon, and has been in the United States for just two years. As a Vietnamese student living abroad, she's experiencing two distinct yet equally rich cultures. And she is interested in how Vietnamese American artists make the connection between a past that's deeply rooted in the soil of Vietnam and a presence that consists of fleeting yet no less meaningful images. She is double majoring in philosophy and communication studies. As part of her philosophy seminar this year, she's re researching postmodernity and avant-garde art, which makes this panel discussion a great opportunity for her to apply postmodern theories in the interpretation and appreciation of Vietnamese American contemporary artworks. Next to her is Julie Dendon, 
who is a senior uh, and a double major in global <coughs> studies and political science. She's been living in the U.S. for three years, and in the course of her studies, she's taken a seminar on the Vietnam War, which provided her with an American perspective on the war. Next to her is Teague Nelson, who is a senior here at Randolph, and he's majoring in history with a minor in film studies and economics. Uh, for a contemporary art class last semester, Teague researched an artist collective called the Propeller Group, which was established in 2006 with dual headquarters in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and Los Angeles. They have an ongoing project called the Vietnam the World Tour uh, that began in 2010 as an anti-nation rebranding campaign. Teague is originally from Seattle and spent this past summer in New York attending an introduction to architecture program at Columbia University and is considered grad school for architecture after life at Randolph. And then finally, uh, the only uh, gentleman here who is not a student, this is Patrick Lee Hubble, who's local. He's originally from Los Angeles, but moved to Virginia and graduated from Appomattox County High School. He then enlisted in the U.S. Navy, serving as a combat medic and dental technician. He was honorably discharged in 1992. He then graduated from Cypress College in Los Angeles and became a licensed funeral director in 1997. He has a very interesting background. He is active in local community, belonging to the Society of American Magicians, uh, the American Legion Post, the Lynchburg Military Reenactors Association. He serves as treasurer of the Lynchburg uh, Libertarian Party and plays with the Blackwater Rugby Football Club and is also a member of Calvary Chapel. And he does Vietnam War reenactments and will be interested to hear what he has to say. He worked at, with Anne Mille, whose uh, black and white photographs over there are on the left, which were taken in Virginia. But I'm actually going to start with a, with a comment that Julie made when she first walked in. And she said she felt at home. And so I wanted to ask her to elaborate on that comment, which I thought was actually very touching. So would you mind? Um, hi, my name is Julie. Um, when I first walked in, I, um, I saw uh, this artwork right here when he was, um, the artwork about a toad saying, you know, the toad is, uh, the, toad is um, the heaven uncle. And um, I also see a lot of, um, Vietnamese like uh, banana trees and uh, bomb halls and um, yeah, it's uh, it seemed like home to me. <laughs> the bánh mì was uh, pretty authentic. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, I had the opportunity to, to talk with Fong last uh, week for about an hour. We went through the exhibition before it was even up. Um, most of the works that were up were by Thomas Dong Vu. And you can pronounce that correctly. Thomas Dong Vu. Kind of close. But I saw the two of you kind of gravitated, I think, towards this one, which is directly behind all of you, where the camera is. So would you mind commenting on the, on the work and kind of your reaction to it, and also some of the text? You'll notice that some of the text is translated, but not all of the text is translated. So it was very interesting um, for me to hear what, what some of those other texts were, and I think it would help fill in the picture a little bit more if you talked about that. Uh, so about that apple, like right over there, you can see the speaker and <clears throat> oh, so that speaker, and then you will see like all the like piece of paper stick on it, and it's mostly saying like like what is your name, what is your father's job, what is your mother's job. Uh, so it's mostly like what the officials at that time, you know, the southern Saigon, like who asked the family like about their background, whether they are communists or not. And I think that when the artists were young, he was with his mom and he's just like, they, they was harassed by the people there, by the officials, and it's just like it's a memory, that kind of haunting for him, that even now when he is in the US, he's still like, think about it and reflect on that as a part of his childhood in Vietnam. And another thing about that is, if you see, it's a kite here. 
isn't in the shape of the kites. It's like what children usually play at that time. They make their own kite from like paper. And then um, here is the thing that you run the thread around. And um, it's just like all tangled up. So I don't really know. It just means like your childhood is, I don't know. Yeah. On the same artwork here, you can see this piece of uh, you can see this piece of paper. Um, uh, if you look at it closely, you can see the other side of the paper is this, um, some Vietnamese. I can't make out what it is, but uh, on the surface of the paper is um, Chinese, and uh, it's mostly say uh, some like prayer to the dead, and um, you like you have to close your eyes and all that, and um, you can see that the handwriting is. Uh, from someone who's really young, so uh, it's, it makes us feel like um, this author is uh, using, you know, a, a, a letter or a piece of paper that he used to write in the past to, uh, in this artwork to, uh, it's like bringing his past into this artwork, that's what we feel like. So that he, he incorporated a lot of poems into his artwork, and that's like one reason that I, we feel really at home when we look at the artwork here just because like these poems are very popular and um, the language is beautiful and it's not the like the modern language it's just like poem from like, the 30s or 40s yeah and it's mostly cons concerned with like life and death and like mourning over death or over the ephemerality of life so yeah table over here. This is, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of toads in the paintings, and so this is what she was just referencing. Um, this is a children's book. It's translated, obviously, from Vietnamese, um, but that's that's one of the reasons why there's the toad imagery, and I'll, I'll, I promise I will put this back after the panel is over with. Um, and actually, would you mind commenting on the one that, uh, where Martha is standing? Right. We had a, a good conversation over there. So, um, toast is not the only animal that uh, we often see in Vietnam, but um, the water buffalo is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can see the, uh, the artwork over here. Um, the water buffalo is um, the main uh, animal that we use for you know, agriculture, and obviously Vietnam is a very heavily agricultural country. Um, so, when I look at this artwork, I um, oh, and, and I learned that uh, the artist is uh, very much hunted with um, bomb holes, um, the bomb crater uh, that's left after the war. And uh, when I look at this artwork, I feel like um, the you know Vietnam is also a very rainy um, country, yeah, rainfall country. So I feel like uh, you know the when the rain fill up the uh, the crater, crater, uh, it's make it like a well, like. Uh, like the buffalo, the water buffalo is looking into this bomb hole, and um, the artist drawing this uh, artwork, you know, from the view of um, the bu um, the water buffalo looking into it. And also, like in our culture, water always means life because like we are an agricultural country, so when there is water, there will be like you know, crop and stop, and it just means like pros prosperity. And bomb crater kind of symbolize the war and destruction, but at the same time, she filled it up with water. So it's just like contrast between like destruction and life and creation. And when the buffalo look into the well and see into the bomb crater, fill up with water and see its own reflection, it just kind of like reflect on the war and on the border of life and death and destruction and creation. Did you want to comment on the, the picture that is right next to it, has the two buffalo climbing? Can you tell me about that? Uh, usually, uh, buffaloes are very friendly and peaceful animals. I don't know why she did want to depict them as being like fighters in that painting. And, um, uh, 
Um, the pardon on uh, the three buffalo is a rare family of pardon in one, uh, one kind of uh, Vietnamese. I don't know how to just um, that's one kind of painting uh, very um, distinguishedly in Vietnam. Uh, it has this Um, it's a very uh, distinct part and it's uh, one of the famous uh, line of Vietnamese painting. Uh, okay. So that's very familiar. And the, those little squirrels are all over like, the surface below as well. Which, I mean, you can't see from this distance, but you'll have to go up and look at it afterwards. Uh, and you were walking around with there are others that, that struck you? Um, I am also struck by the photograph by Bin Zan in the other room because like instead of just like have the photograph on a he just like he make it on leaf and all the like natural thing and what he want to say is just like it's a photograph of a person and one is like imprinted on a leaf it could take on another life. It's special. It's like irreplaceable. It's like cannot be duplicated. Also, most of the photos are of young people from the world, and it's just tragic to think that you are dying at a very young age, and most of all of the all that is left of you is just like your photo at your at the best time of your life. Um, on that, that theme of dying young. Oh, do you want to what is the saying? Oh, then, um, if you see the, yeah, the golden toad and then under that there's a lie which say that I wish I could live until I am 40. That is like a common saying of people at that time because like, there was a war there and people usually just don't live long. So like they only wish at that time is nothing fancy, just to live until they are 40. And then in relation to the photograph in the other room, and then you can rest, you can see that most people die young and like there's nothing left of them. And like off, in an interview with Bin Zan on, that I watched on YouTube, he said that like since he came to the US really early, he emigrated here when he was two years old. And the only thing that he can recall about his childhood in, in Vietnam is a photograph of him two years old. And he always like wonder like, what is my past? What is my identity? Like, I cannot like recognize myself in this photo. I don't have any recollection of the war at all. And then he like set out on like a journey to like find out about his past and find out about his like country. And he said that like, he tried to recreate and making history because like, he can read history in a book, but it's just like, it's objective, it doesn't give much meaning to his life. And he wants to recreate that history by like, get a photograph of people from the war and then put it on like leaves and on other plants. Because for him, like, it, like, it's like a religion. It's like help him understand like life and death and just like how... Uh, because like, in our culture we think that when you die you come back to the land and you like become decay, you become a part of the surrounding, the environment. And that's exactly what he did with the photo over there. He like kind of like immortalized the people into the leaves. I wanted to point out that the artists in this exhibition are all in their 40s or 50s, so they all they all lived past 40, so that's a good thing. Um, Teague, I wanted to pass pass the buck over to the mic over to you. Do you have some comments on any? 
you of worms? Anything that struck you? Um, yeah, I, I, when I came in and looked around, when I took the walk through, I, I was struck. Um, a common theme that runs through all these things is landscape. Mm -hmm. You have the photographs uh, with, the, with the images on them in the other room, as well as the daguerreotypes, which um, he took as, as, as a way of trying to, as um, somebody who came here from Vietnam, trying to fit himself into the North American landscape. And then you look around, you have these photographs that were um, where the, the artist took them as uh, he positioned the people, and, and he was trying to he was he was he was trying to reach back to the I think the British um, landscape painters to try to arrange them to resemble those. Um, you have the 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 uh, enactments over here. And the landscape is so sharp in these, it's, it, the landscape almost becomes um, like its own character in these pieces. Um, and, you know, we, I guess we each bring different things to these, our own experiences. Um, and I... Well, it's a nice tie-in with what they, were, what they kind of ended with saying about that nature and landscape is so important. You're kind of returning to the land. The, that focus on landscape in, in each of the works. Did anyone want to comment on what's directly behind you? Because this is actually something everyone's facing. <laughs> so did everyone have a chance to look at these? These are sort of the, the only ones really that are not related to the Vietnam War. So any comments on these? Uh, these photos are by, are by people who are and he just like, <laughs> Another Western? Yeah, another Western, and he tried to put on a lot like different identities. You can see he can be a cowboy, uh, a musician, a farmer, and a photographer. Yeah. And it's just like the way I think about it is he never really looked straight to the camera, so it's just more that you are looking. At yourself, it, like it's different from looking at yourself in the mirror and see your own image reflected at you. And if he's just standing in front of the photograph, he just look at himself as being someone else. And these photos are made pretty early when he first came to the U.S. So it's just kind of like he can explore around and like put on different identities because here is the country of freedom, and you can be whatever you want to be. So maybe that's just like his team and motivation for the photographs. Patrick, I wanted to, to get to you too. Um, would you tell us what it was like um, working with Amila on the um, photographs that were taken there in Virginia? Sure. Uh, most, of, most of the events I participate in are static displays. and I, I actually wear the uniforms from the Vietnam War and conflict and display a lot of equipment and what have you. But every now and then we do some actual living history events as we call them where we actually, the GIs will stay on a, on, a, on a base camp and there's thatched roof villages we can imagine. There's property here in Virginia where the gentleman has sown wild bam bamboo and what have you. So it's as close as we can get it to Vietnam as we can. And we call and it Vietnam. Virginia Beach, right? One place was at Fort Story and others in near Louisa, Virginia on private property. I like experiencing things three-dimensionally and it helps you understand why men were fatigued and couldn't capture this hill 301 because they just marched X amount of miles with so much gear on their back and it gives you a better understanding of some things that you can't absorb in a book. I work with Anne and Mai. She uh, brought a, a whole different perspective from the Vietnamese civilian um, aspect of it. Um, taught a lot of the villagers. We actually have uh, Vietnamese people that come out with us and reenact with us as well, and wrapping uh, rice in banana leaves and what have you, making balls out of it, and uh, just other little uh, idiosyncrasies and customs that things that us Westerners don't pick up on. And then she, she brought a new level of authenticity to our reenactments, which is the focus of it. Not so much cowboys and Indians. We like the the immersion into the living history is the aspect we like about reenacting. And she was valuable resource and I hear our work student or photographers doing really, really well. 
So do you have any um, reactions to any of the three works that we have here in the exhibition? I do, I'm pretty excited. The, uh, the first photograph there is actually my hammock. <laughs> yeah, I bought it from a, uh, uh, a gentleman in Vietnam and was managed, managed to go through a few channels to get that. It's actually a North Vietnamese issue a military hammock and I bought it in 68. So to see it in a photograph now is kind of some of my collection on display. <laughs> Call that one. Those uh, the other two photos. I I know what's trying to be portrayed there. The actual photographer's in the third photo, and she's uh, talking with a special forces advisor. Um, oftentimes, the South Vietnamese operated it. The, the nickname for them were Kit Carsons. They were they operated as scouts and what have you. Um, and I suspect that's that's probably being portrayed there. She's a Kit Carson Kit Carson scout, um, showing safe trails and paths and what have you. And, Assume that's probably what's being reenacted. I'm so, not in that photo. So how often? I, I tried to convince him to tell all of you that that was him in the photograph, <laughs> but he, he wouldn't play along. <laughs> but, um, so how often do you do Vietnam uh, War reenactments, and where do you do them? Of course, they're only done during the summer months for obvious reasons. Um, and all over Virginia, there is a site also in Pennsylvania too, in an army. Uh, Heritage Museum, we do some static displays up there where they have another uh, fire base, reconstructed fire base up there, and we just educate the public. So probably about, I don't know, three or four events a year. And I also do a static display on Veterans Day, or uh, Memorial Day, excuse me, on the Monument Terrace, and usually do a setup there as well. So the, the next one, when will the next one be? We just had our last uh, Vietnam reenactment um, about two weekends ago, so that's it for the summer. So we just missed him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to keep this brief, so I'm going to open the floor up for questions. Does anyone have any questions for any of our speakers? Yeah, um, I just had a question about the bowl painting. Mm -hmm. um, what is the red uh, or blackish imprint on the face? <laughs> yeah. Or is there any, I don't know if I missed something. Oh, I think it's just like the water buffalo is shot, like right in the face. Oh, it's a cool yeah. yeah. And it means it's contrasting because like it is shot, but it just looks pretty serene and it doesn't really have like any crush on its or pain on its on its face. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I, uh, I took that to be um, a crater from one of the bombs itself, mm -hmm. and I saw. I guess I saw the bowl as not um, like a physical bowl, but more like a metaphor for the agricultural uh, regeneration in the country. I just saw the, the um, so sort of the reddish crater as as um, sort of the lasting impact, but that it's been sort of absorbed back into regrowth. Oh, okay. Someone else that I didn't see raised a hand? Oh, hi, Kathy. This is for the two Vietnamese students. Did your relatives talk very much about the war? And can you please your question, please? Did, 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 your, did your relatives talk about the war? Did your relatives very much about the Vietnamese war? Do you want to answer? Uh, <coughs> I'm from, uh, I was born and raised in the north, in, uh, the, in Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam. And um, she, was, uh, she was raised mostly at the time in Saigon. So our uh, perspective may be a little bit different. So you want to speak first? Okay, so just a personal story. Just like my dad used to be like a part of the, used to be a soldier of the Vietnam War. So he went to, um, um, uh, I mean, he got a university degree, but then he just got like drafted without his. I mean, at that time, most people are expected to go to war. You cannot really stay because people will think of you as being cold. So he went to war, and then he went to war for ten years, and most of his friends and most of his comrades died, and it's just like 
after that, he really never talked about the war to us. Most of the stuff that I know about, which is like what I read on the internet. And like, I don't know, it's just a thing. People don't really talk about it. It's like, it's like a wound that people don't want to like open it up. And I think it's the same thing for Thomas Thuấn Lạc Vũ because like it's haunting for him, but like there's no way he can like clarify or make it clear on or so he just kept his painting he just kept like abstract, but it's tragic to look at if I make sense. Is that clear? Kathy? I'm here. Oh yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. Oh, and um, for me, uh, my, st uh, my dance was uh, drafted into the communist force for one or two years, but at that time the war was almost, almost ended, so uh, he didn't really uh, have very deep or like, a lot of story to tell me about the war, but uh, my mother family, uh, my two uncles was uh, drafted but they, well, they didn't really go to the war because it's already ended. But uh, my family has a lot of story when they had to, um, you know, went to refugee uh, for many, many years because of the war. And uh, my mom always like tell me over and over and over again about how, um, how, like they have to, run, you know, they have to drop school, run away, they have to uh, take care of themselves. Uh, do you uh, like? raise a uh, bubbly warm to make silk um, you know to uh, do farming and um, a lot of chores work but uh, I don't uh, they usually they don't really get into the political stuff uh, I think um, because it's get really controversial and you want to move on mostly yes any other questions Um, on this painting in the back, what is this device or like is it right down here with the uh, products or yes. yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> political culture, so we have a lot of government buildings and uh, um, a very rich culture aspect to it. So you don't see a lot of like skyscraper like in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, but um, uh, you see a lot of temple pagodas uh, uh, and it get really quiet. Uh, usually after 12, uh, I think the government make everything close. Uh, so. Yeah, but in contrast to it, Ho Chi Minh City is a really, really robust city. Maybe Phu gets better to it. I mean, from my perspective, I just feel like these days people glorify the victory and glorify the Communist Party and like the those who really go to war don't really talk much about it. So it's just kind of like a really important and significant part about the war is kind of being forgotten. And the people just kind of have empty talk about how great our soldiers were, how great the victory is, how how, many, how much progress that we are making. So I just, I, I feel like this art would like, I'm more truthful to history than what is going on at home right now and the media and the empty propaganda at home. Yeah, 
that's what you got uh, from like 12 year education in Vietnam. You get stuff a lot of um, like this history stuff about the Vietnam War, but it's mostly about how you know victorious the com the communist force is. But um, I think um, the the young generation nowadays, my generation, mostly we are very um, dissatisfied with the progress that the country has been making. So that's why we have we actually have this phenomenon where um, uh, we have like. Brain, yeah. brain bleeding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When um, you know our generation is uh, studying abroad a lot and don't come back.